Hello, I'm A.R. Bernard. Welcome to the New School of Biblical Theology. We are an institute with renowned faculty dedicated to forming men and women in service to Jesus Christ and to serving as an unsurpassed resource for the global community. My time at NSBT has allowed you know, me to not only be mentored, but become a mentor. NSBT is just preparing me as a layperson to go out into the marketplace and to spread the gospel. The best word I can say is a transformational experience. It's changed possibly everything that I've been doing as far as my day-to-day -day work. It's changed everything. We hope you'll join us in this mission and register today for our next semester. It will change your life, leadership, and ministry. Well, let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come to and gather still in this time and this season. Where things have been challenging, Lord, we say thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we pray and say thank you for the chains that were broken during the praise and worship. The inspiration that came upon our hearts as we saw the Aeolians singing. And Lord, we ask that you continue to have your way throughout the rest of this service to just continue developing us so that we can be unapologetic Christians representing Christ in culture. So Lord, meet us where we are. Meet our needs. Respond to our act of faith. Bless me as I speak a word in season. So say, have your way. I am your tool in the master's cra master craftsman's hand. I am your brush in the master painter's hand. Choose what you decide to choose and use and do with me. For I'm yours, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Uh, for those who are looking for Dr. Bernard, he's not here, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to be before you long. Um, I got a message. Um, just to let you know, we minister struggle. All right, okay, wait, let me, let me back up. Back up. It was <laughs> I was impressed. Were you not impressed by this, uh, the, mess, the music? See, I was reading up after I made fun of uh, Elder, Elder Battle and his music, uh, you know, and I, I repented backstage. I, I did for those who told me to watch myself. And um, I started looking up and I said, wow, the music that they sang, the hymns that they sang did so much for them. Right? And, and when we look at all the things that has happened, you would hear them break out into songs in the field after one of them slipped one of their family members were killed. They had no other way to, 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 to go through a process of, of remorse and, and mourning because if they started mourning, if they showed any type of emotion to, uh, tied to that act that led that person to the death, they would be in trouble too. So they had to start finding out outlets. So these songs started taking on different meaning. It, it, it just, it, I started realizing when, when they're out in the fields and they, they want to be able to, to bring some unity in the vastness of the field that they're working in. You hear a, 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 a sound over here, and then you hear a response all the way on the other side, and next thing you know, all throughout the field, you hear this song happening. And I said, wow, God, even within the text, through song, you're meeting our needs. So when I saw that, I was like, wow, God, wow. And one of my favorite songs is, no man shall deliver me, no man. No sing? You tell me not to sing? <laughs> All right, I'm not going to sing. Other battle gave me that look. I thought you were cool. <laughs> man. But I just want you to pray for them, especially for a young generation to be out there singing this. <laughs> especially when you look at for the older generation, well, not for the older generation, for the newer generation coming up, they are somewhat detached from this type of music. They detach not only just from the music, but the, the things that led to this type of music. They didn't have instruments. They didn't have the guitar, the band. They, you know, they might have had a little washboard or something just to get the beat going, you know, get the rhythm going. 
But they had to harmonize with no training. They had to know to learn the lyrics. And they might not even be near each other in order to sing the lyrics because they might be two different uh, families owning two different individuals uh, uh, working at the same farm. I said, wow, to see young individuals up here doing that, it, was, it just it blessed my heart today. It blessed my heart today. So pastor called me and said, I want you to minister. This time he gave me a, a, a lot of time. He gave me a lot of time to prepare. And I told him, I said, Daddy, I'm having, um, what, what would they call it for uh, ministers, a writer's block? Because I had messages in the queue. You know, he just said, be prepared. But, I, you know, my, my biggest thing is, said, Lord, what do I need to minister for this group of individuals coming for this Sunday at this specific time? So a good message might be a good message, but not a good message for, the, for this timing. It might be not be a good message for this group. So I'm wrestling, I'm like, Daddy, I, I don't know. I might have to call one of the ministers. I just, I just couldn't. You know, I'm like, Lord, I, I, I need to hear your voice. How many have you ever been that, at that place where you're, you're seeking for the voice of God you, and you, all you do is you feel this thing called silence in the midst of your, 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 the, the things that you're going through as you try to wrestle with it and say, Lord, I am about your will. I'm about your work. I'm doing this for you. Lord, please speak to me. And I was at a place. I called my dad and, and he said, well, what, what's on your heart? I said, there's a lot on my heart. I said, turn on the TV, I can give you a list of things that's on my heart. You know, the, 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 the rise of the demonic forces that are moving in such an uh, aggressive way. I said, Lord, Lord, there's so much happening just in that spiritual realm that we can talk about. You look at how it's infiltrating the church and, and, and the, the certain individuals are not seeing how they're being used, manipulated by these demonic forces and they call themselves doing the work of God. And he said, no. So I said, there's a lot I could talk about. On that perspective. And then you go look at it and say, okay, Lord, where are we? Is, 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 are, are we at the end times, end of the end of the end of the end times because we've been in the end times for 2,000 years plus? So I said, we can talk about that and, and look at it and say, okay, how do we prepare the church? Because you got people with one theology about the rapture, post-rapture, pre-rapture, after-rapture, rapture, no rapture, there's a rapture. But the reality is we have to prepare the church to be able to respond. Is the mark coming? How far is it? Is it down a block or is it knocking at our door? So this is what I'm wrestling with. I said, so, so I, I, I can give you a list of stuff. He said, well, what's on your heart that you're peaceful about? I said, well, right now, is it coming out of... Lent, interacting with most individuals, trying to understand how their journey was and just cheering them on and, and, and you know, being the, the cheerleader on the side, just, you know, you can do this, you can do this. It was, I, I landed at a place, and this is what I'm going to speak about today, and I'm going to do it fast. I speak fast because I had five brothers to compete with for the attention of my parents. So if I didn't hurry up and get it out, they're gonna cut me off. So let me just calm down because I'm by myself today. <laughs> and taking notes, and then we have the, the people signing and I just send them my notes earlier so they couldn't get prepared correctly. So I'm gonna slow down. I'm just excited. There's an excitement that happens when you finally hear the voice of God after such a long time of not hearing it. Because, they, come on, if we don't hear the voice of God say, okay, Lord, did I do something to offend you? Lord, where are we in our relationship? Right? But silence from God doesn't necessarily mean distance from God. I said it again, silence from God, a perceived silence from God does not necessarily mean a distancing from God. And I know some of you were dealing with that in this Lent experience in Lord, 40 days of fasting and praying and, and devotionals and stuff like that. I'm, I'm still waiting to hear from you. Man, I know this Christian walk is not easy. I understand it's not easy, but this is the best explanation that fits into what we call reality. 
the best explanation that fits into reality. And as I had conversations with individuals, I said, okay, what, what, what's the thing that you wrestle with? And it landed at these four things where the main individuals people wrestle with. It was the four answers that we receive from God. And the first answer is, we love this. This is the God we love. First answer we receive is yes. We love that. That's, that's God. God is good. Won't he do it? You praying to get your yes? Especially he answers right away. Oh, look at God. Look at God. Come on. Let's, let's tell the truth. This is how we are. Right? When there's a yes, we know there's a God. Let me read this for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be bouncing around between, you know, 1 and 7, verses 1 and 7. It's the lady with, you know, the widow with the oil. <laughs> and this lady came to the prophet Elijah fearful because of creditors. He owed money. And I think this is a type I, I, I would say this is a type of what we just dealt with in Resurrection Sunday. Because we all had debt that we could not pay. So Elisha's fearful, uh, she came to the prophet Elisha, fearful. A creditor had threatened to, make, to take her two sons as slaves unless she paid her debt that she owed. Elisha asked us, what do you have in your house? Nothing except a small jar of olive oil. See, something small in God's hands, right? Something small in your hands becomes something major in God's hands. Nothing except a small jar of oil, she replied. At that point, Elisha told her, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each filled... Put it on the side. Once the jars were filled, Elisha told her to sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and it will be enough money left over to support you and your sons. Yeah, I got new, new glasses. This is why I, I, I got to really apologize, Elder. Because all of a sudden, I'm looking, and, and then I'm trying to read, and I have to find that sweet spot. <laughs> so when I go to the doctor, I said, doctor, something wrong. He said, no, you're just getting old. <laughs> so I'm trying to get used to this thing called progressive lenses. You got to find that spot right down because it gets progressively stronger and stronger. So I'm trying to read. <laughs> so just bear with me, okay, saints? So don't worry, Elder. I'm, I'm, eating, I'm eating my words, you know? See, but there's a lesson that we can learn from this story. When you're looking for God's yes, we need to first consider that we may begin. I'm sorry, that it may begin with you simply changing your perspective. We must first consider that it can begin with changing your perspective because many times you already have the answer within you. See, this widow actually became the part of the solution for her own problem. Write this down. A yes from God will almost always be connected to a person. A yes from God will always, almost always be connected to a person. This is why we, Dr. Ron has taught us that relationships are the network for life. When he is ready to take you to the next level, he always sends a person. Now this person can serve directly or indirectly to fulfill God's purpose in your life. She, Elijah showed up not to give her more oil, but challenged her perspective. But she trusted God and still gave the little she had. And because of her obedience and taking care of someone else's Needs, God took care of her. Remember, when God says yes, get ready to use what you already have and be open to a change of perspective. Amen. Say to your neighbor, say neighbor. neighbor. When, God says yes, when God says yes, get ready, get ready. 
to use what you already have and to be open to a change of perspective. See, because your idea of what yes looks like can look very different from God's yes. I love it in Isaiah chapter 55, 8 through 9. You don't have to go to it. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So the first thing that people were looking, searching for throughout this late experience was, Lord, I need an answer. And for some of us, we got a yes. For some of us, we got a yes. Number two, though, for some of us, we got to know. For some of us, we got to know. And that's when you shout, the devil's a liar. <laughs> that no ain't from God. Some of you get mad. And so I say, I got to pray harder. And so I sound like Miss o um, O'Neill when he was singing that Spanish song. <laughs> And sometimes y'all pray so hard that, that y'all, your guy's like, okay, what is he saying? What's she saying? I got Americano over there. See, but God's no, based on where you are in maturity, is necessary. Let, let, let's go to the, to, to the text. And some, you know, I got to make sure we, we keep the Bible in this, this conversation. And this was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 39. He said, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, out of press. And he told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with them Peter and two, of, two sons of Zebedee, James and John, he began to grieve and greatly distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved. Now this is the, the, the man because remember, God, Jesus was all man and all God. And the humanity started coming out of him because he saw what he was about to go through. And some of us, we get afraid of what we're about to go through. He said his soul was deeply grieved so that he almost, he said, so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and stay awake and keep, with, keep watch with me. And after going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, that is, if it's consistent with your will in the Amplified Bible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. See, the humanity of, of, of Jesus was wrestling with the desire and looking for an answer. He said, Lord, I give you this cup. And Jesus, God said, No. You see, and the reason why we have to understand it, in actuality, every unanswered prayer is simply God's grace intervening for many reasons. Some we may never understand. However, when God says no, Proverbs chapter 3, verse, uh, verses 5 through 6 says, we must lean not on our own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Some of us can look back at a few unanswered prayers and praise God today. He said no. Come on, some of us, is somebody in the balcony can say, yeah, I, I thank God. He said no. I prayed for Bob and now I look at Bob on Instagram I'm like, oh Lord, thank you for saying no. Come on now, we got to talk the real stuff here. You, some of you gentlemen prayed for, for, for Felicia and said, oh no, bye Felicia. <laughs> Come on now, we tell the truth here. There's some, some times when we think back at the goodness of God and part of the goodness of God. Like all my life, you have been faithful. And part of that faithfulness is saying no. So imagine God answered Jesus' prayer that day. None of us would be sitting here today. See, so trust God's will for your life. And remember that your unanswered prayer 
will affect everyone around you. So you got to understand that when God said no to Jesus, look at the effects that he had to many. So shift the perspective and and say, okay, well, maybe my no is not just because of me, but the benefit of everybody else. Because if I get what I want, how will it affect individuals around me? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. How about this This is the struggle, especially when it comes to health. Chapter 12, verses uh, 7 through 10. He says, in the thorn and the flesh, because of the surpassing greatness and extraordinary nature of the revelations which I received from God, for this reason, to keep me from thinking of myself as important, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Nobody knows what the thorn was. Some people speculate. Was he a little... You know, a little heavy on the Hennessy? <laughs> Nobody knows. Was he, you know, a cusser? You know, was Paul going around cussing people out? Nobody knows. You know, do you have a bad attitude, ready to fight and kill somebody? Nobody knows. They just know he had a thorn in his flesh and he didn't like it. And how many of us are in a place where there's certain things that we deal with with ourselves that we have that we don't like? He said, the thorn in the flesh was given to me a message, a message of Satan to torment and harass me, to keep me from exalting myself concerning this. I pleaded with, in, with the Lord three times that it might, leave, it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. He said, and in the Amplified Bible, you know, tries to unpack that. He says, my loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough. Always available, regardless of the situation. For my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly Boast of the weakness, so that the power of Christ, the power of Christ may, be, may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. So I am well pleased with my weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, and with difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I'm weak in human strength, I am strong, truly able, powerful, Truly drawn from God's strength. So ultimately, God's no is directly connected to your Christianity. God's no is directly connected to your Christianity. So the first thing is yes. The second answer is no. The third answer is not yet. And this is one of the ones that we wrestle with. Not yet. And I love this text that I'm going to read. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, for the sake of time, I'm going to Jamalize it. Jamalism, right? In J- Daniel chapter 3, verses uh, 24 and 27. But I'm going to go back a little bit in my Jamalism. that says, so you got Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You got King Nebuchadnezzar. He builds this statue. I used to assume that people would know this text because some people, but some people I have learned haven't gotten out of Genesis yet. So in Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, King Nebuchadnezzar, gets puffed up, ends up wanting to build this statue, builds this statue, and he says, whoever, uh, when you ever hear the music instruments, you got to pray to it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we're good, right? I'm good. King Nebuchadnezzar, they play the instruments. Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is chilling, watching everybody bow, like, nah, these people are bugging. So then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gets yelled at by King Nebuchadnezzar, and he goes and says, what man of God can save you? He said, look, even if my God, he said, my God has the power. So we have to understand that God has the power to respond the way he wants to respond. I'll try this again. Maybe somebody in the balcony, you know, right here in the ramp. God has the power to respond the way he wants to respond. 
And sometimes we, our faith should have us land on a place where, Lord, the way you respond, you're going to respond. And here it is, Shadrach, Meshach, they said, no, we're good. They get thrown into the furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendel goes in the furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace and says, hey, didn't we throw three individuals? I see a fourth individual. It might be the son of God. Or the type, the shadow, depending on what translation you read. He says, let them out. They come out. And what we realize is that God didn't say no for deliverance. He said, not yet. And the reality is sometimes, because God's a big picture God. God is a God. He, 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 he does things in a place where, see, we only see the physical realm. But the reality is when God is moving, especially at such a magnitude, he is making statements both in the physical realm as well as the spiritual realm. That's why I love it when David was, was fighting Goliath. He said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill this Goliath. I'm going to kill this guy. He said so that, the, so, so that humanity can see. But there's a little text that a lot of people glaze over because everybody wants to kill their giants. But what's the reason for your killing of your giants? See, David said, so that man can see the might of the God we serve. And then there's a little spot. He says, and so will the council. Now, if you are part of the, the spiritual war classes, you understand the council was the assemblance of the, the angels. So when David was killing his giant, he was making a statement on behalf of God. For both the earthly realm and the heavenly realm. So when you, unless you're ready to make a statement from the earthly realm and the heavenly realm, stop trying to go out there and say, I'm killing my giants. Just so that you can show off on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. <laughs> so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got freed for the sake of time. See, this was a God, divine, supernatural power and protection at work here. We have to remember that God is about the big picture. God is working through our waiting. Say to your neighbor, say, God is waiting, working through your waiting. Turn to your other neighbor, say, other neighbor, God is working through your waiting. See, I'm not a fan of waiting. Believe you me, I'm the worst at Christmas time. Yes, still at 40 years old. My wife has to hide my Christmas gifts. No, really, I am bad. To the point where, like, my mother used to buy us Christmas gifts. We used to find them, play with them, and we rewrap them and put it back on the tree. I'm bad, like, so, so my, and my wife knows I can wrap, so I can open a gift and then rewrap it and not get caught. So she really has to hide it and can't, she, she doesn't wrap my gifts or brings them out until I'm sleeping. And one time I tried to fake like I was sleeping. She heard me. I'm, I, I don't like waiting. I'm, I'm so bad that I won't even, I, I, like it's, it's torture for me to not even be able to give my wife her present before time. Like I'm gonna give my kids their present. I'm like, look, it, 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 it hurts me. So to the point where I end up starting to shop a little later because waiting a month, I used to shop a month ahead of time, right? Get the sales, get the deals budget everything out and stuff like that. But I had to stop because I was giving the gifts away. I'm like, oh, I just got this for you. I just couldn't wait for Christmas. <laughs> See, but when God makes us wait, he makes us wait in loving wisdom. Say loving wisdom. See, God makes us wait in loving wisdom. God uses waiting to increase our trust, to teach us a lesson, or to train us. Once again, God, he, he makes us wait in loving wisdom. You gotta, I hope you get that part. Loving wisdom. So there's a, 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 a methodology behind saying not yet. Something's going on. Something's happening. There's certain elements and key components have to be in place for him to respond to your prayer. Whether it's your heart or the heart of the person that he's going to use to bless you. You got to say there's a bigger picture. There's always a bigger picture. So he, in his loving wisdom, he uses 
We need to, one, increase our trust. Or possibly, number two, to teach us a lesson. And number three, or number three, is to train us, to develop us. Because the first question I ask is, are you prepared to receive what you're asking for? See, people want a Mercedes Benz until they got to put it in the shop. You, you said how much it costs to do a brake job? Fifteen. Fifteen. Fifteen what? <laughs> Lord have mercy. I've had Pastor Jamal slipping up and, and saying some words. I said, what's the difference with those brakes? What kind of brakes are those? So God is training us, preparing us. On the other hand, our waiting is about a bigger picture. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their time of waiting was about the future relationship Israel would have with the king of Nebuchadnezzar. Once he pulled them out of the furnace, the dynamics of the, of the way Israel was treated by, in Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar shifted to the point where he started promoting their God. Remember I preached this before, I said, he said, he said, if anybody says something against their God, I'm gonna kill them. See, your waiting is bigger than what you're trying to accomplish right then and there. See, King Nebuchadnezzar, you never, nobody knew when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, wait, we're gonna wait for God to deliver us, and then the way God delivered us was to change the future trajectory of the relationship between Israel and Nebuchadnezzar. And you, please understand me, not only did it, 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 it change the trajectory of the King Nebuchadnezzar, it, the story went ahead of them, of what their God did with the, to other kings. So our time of waiting is more about your future than your present. Your time of waiting is more about your future than your present. And the last one, the last one, in five minutes, we're going to talk fast, is I have something better. I have something better. So we hadn't, yes, we hadn't no, we had not yet, but God said, look, I have something better. He said, you're asking for this, I, I need you to think bigger. You're asking for this, I need you to take, take it up another level. Like Dr. Renard taught us, he said, he said, prayer is elevating your heart, your will, and your mind. He said, come on, look, come up here. Step up your game up in prayer. Be audacious with what you ask for. He said, you want to get over a cold? That's lightweight. He so said, give me something really that will challenge your faith. Give me, ask me for something to do that would challenge your faith. So what text do I have is John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It says, Jesus turns water into wine. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And it wasn't just regular jars. It was dirty, nasty, grungy jars. jars. He said, fill them to the brim. But he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everything, uh, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. After they got drunk. Everybody got drunk. So I give him the cheap wine. He said, but you have saved the best till now. So you can keep drinking the water you have, or you can wait until Jesus shows up and turn it into wine. The best wine at that. And this is metaphor speaking. I, got you, I know you got the super saints that don't believe in you know, drinking wine. You know. Oh, y'all waiting for me to say what I believe. 
I'll wait for Dr. Nard to respond to, to the theology of the house on drinking wine. But I said, come to the table. He's prepared for me. <laughs> so you can keep drinking the water you have, or you can wait until Jesus shows up to turn it into wine. Not just regular wine, but the best wine. That expensive stuff. That stuff that you got to wipe the dust off. From what I heard. <laughs> so turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. I'll wait for Jesus. Wait See, some of us are in such a rush that we settle for water instead and use it all up because we just couldn't wait. So God doesn't have anything to, ha to even work a miracle with you because you use it all up. We really have to learn how to wait better. Turn to your neighbor and say, learn how to wait better, neighbor. And know that God's delay is not necessary, his denial. See, I think God, you know, because of his omniscience, he has always a better way of accomplishing what you want to accomplish. God has a better route for you to take to your destination. See, God's plans are not our plans. God's plans are above from a, a, an intellectual basis that we can barely comprehend why he's moving the way he's moving. Yeah. Amen. See, I, know, I don't know about you, but I don't want anything too soon if I won't be able to handle it. Yeah. And the reason why God is not quick to give you something you can't handle, and write this down, because he doesn't want your blessing to quickly turn into a burden. Because when he blesses you, he wants you to enjoy it. But if you're not prepared for it, it can become a burden. So as I close here, we get so caught up in the circumstances that we bicker and complain and risk missing what's coming to us and disqualifying ourselves with our own attitudes and our own impatience. We have to learn how to wait better during the journey of waiting is where the true blessing happens. That's where you lean into Jesus a little more. You start praying a little more. You start fasting a little more. You start believing a little more. And ultimately what God wants for us is what he will deliver to us. See, God wants us to cling to him more. Waiting is a form of long suffering. And in Romans chapter 5, 3 to 5, tells us exactly what we receive when we learn how to wait. It says, we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Suffering produces what? Perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. So ultimately, even in a time of waiting, we should still have hope. So whether God answers a yes, God's answer is a no, God's answer is a not yet, or God's answer is something better. Remember, the author of your story is God. Remember that the author of your story has plans for you. Not to harm you but to give you prosperity. Remember, there's a bigger picture. And remember, the answer to your prayer doesn't only affect you. And many times, it requires another person. So don't fret. Don't be anxious of anything. Get out of the rut. Cut the bickering. Cut the comp complaining. Take advantage of the opportunity to learn to lean into him more. Trust his will. 
Trust his timing. Be open to changing your perspective and learn how to wait better because your journey is so much greater than the destination. Amen? So I say all of this to boil it down to this one statement that God's answers is about you being or becoming the person to handle God's yes, God's no, God's not yet, and something better. Amen? Amen. The, all the bell is rushing me off the stage. Look how, she she's about amen, amen. <laughs> Come on, Elder. I got to behave because Elder, Elder, Elder prayed for me from when I was... Praise God. Little... <laughs> <laughs> and Pastor Jamal, as you were ministering, I couldn't help but to reflect on the beautiful music that came from our visiting choir. One of the songs that resonated in me and to me was softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. Yes. With that being said, I'm going to excuse myself so you can do the altar call. But don't Praise me. God. Don't me again. <laughs> I thank God for that call today. Maybe some of you in the building have not answered to that soft call. Some of you watching by way of internet have not yet answered to that soft, tender voice of Jesus. And if you have not, today is an excellent day for you to say yes to his word, yes to his will, yes to that call. I'm inviting you today to come and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not to become a member of this local ministry, which that's not a bad thing to do, but to make a greater step. Say yes to the call of the Lord. And if I'm talking to you, let me just see you wave your hand. Just hold your hand up so I can acknowledge you. Praise God by way of internet. You can even type into the chat, I accept the call. I literally say yes to the call of Jesus today. And if you here in the building, just come and I'll just pray with you. Just come to the altar and I'll pray with you right now. Because we want to empower you for such a time as this, when the hell howls. Come on, let's, let's stand and pray for these individuals that are coming down the altar. Are literally trying to discourage you. I want you to know you have a family of God praying with you, praying for you right now in the name of Jesus. So Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we take authority over every plot, every plan, and every scheme of the devil. We render them inoperative, null, and void in the name of Jesus. And as these individuals in the building, online, accepts you today as their Lord and Savior. We thank you for going the distance with each one of them. And from this day forward, be their Lord, be their Savior, be their leader, be their God, be their comfort, be the lifter of their head. My brothers and sisters, those of you at the altar, repeat after me. Dear Jesus, today I accept you 
as my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, I will serve you, live for you, commit my life to you, and call you Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, congregation, for joining with us. Those of you online, there's some information on the screen. Text, make a phone call, and we will minister with you. I encourage you, getting a church home, a Bible teaching ministry that will encourage you, that will walk with you, talk with you, and go the distance with you as becoming a child of God. Welcome to the family of God. God bless you. Right on, am I on? Right now. Am I on? Amen, amen, amen. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Like I said earlier, this walk of Christianity is not easy, but I believe it is possible. But anything worth going after is going to take work. Right? Anything of worth takes work. And I believe that Christianity is the, the, the best answer that responds to where does this all come from? Why do I exist? Right? What, what, what happens after life? Is there meaning to this time that I'm on this earth? The biblical responses, the biblical narrative is one of the best narratives that we can add to this thing called reality. And you know why? To me, it's the one of the best also. Because every other religion lands on us chasing. But it's Christianity that lands with God chasing. That's why I love that Anthony Brown song, You Thought I Was Worth Saving. Yeah. Only Christianity can say that. Yeah. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to always be in the presence of the Almighty God. So Lord, as we leave this place, we ask that your presence follows, leads, and sits. Lord, we pray for traveling mercies to and from each and every destination while we are at each and every destination. Lord, that as we ponder on the message that was spoken today, Lord, one that will get us through the different, different seasons of our lives. Lord, I pray and ask that you just, just touch our eyes to see your will, Lord. Touch our ears to hear your voice, Lord. Touch our hearts to let go, to make room for what you desire. And touch our minds to comprehend and understand all that is happening, both personally and globally, Lord. Tie the knots. Connect them the dots. So, Lord, we ask for discernment in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. As we leave this place but never God's presence, Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it. We proclaim it. And we've seen it come to pass. God bless and enjoy your week. Family, thank you so much for watching CCC's YouTube channel. If you feel what you just experienced impacted your life in any way, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this video with others so we can fulfill our mission in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We welcome you to check out some of our other videos. Also, make sure to click the notification bell so you are the first to know when we post a new one. Our praise and worship team brings us a powerful and dynamic live worship experience every Sunday. And trust me and Cameron when I say, you do not want to miss it. Streaming times are in the description box below. And if you are looking for any other information about what's happening here at CCC, visit www.cccinfo.org. We hope to see you next Sunday, but for now, continue to have a blessed week in the Lord.